Hey there, welcome to Disaster Podcaster. If this is your first time, we're glad to have you and we hope you enjoy it. Make sure you go back and check out a lot of the past episodes. If you're one of our regulars, pull up your favorite chair, get your favorite drink. Welcome back. We're glad to have you here. I think you're going to like the next series of this. Um, just a little bit about Disaster Podcaster. This podcast is, is hosted by me, Clark Brown, the owner of Restoration Advisors. We are a consulting and coaching group for the restoration disaster industry. And this podcast is where we just openly talk about a lot of the facets of this industry, the messy shit, not all the pretty things, the wins, the losses, sometimes the equipment. We have great uh, interviews with people. We just try to cover it all to entertain you for sometimes 30 to 50 minutes per week if we can. Uh, you may be watching this on YouTube so that you can see the visual. Not much to see. Uh, then we have it a podcast on your favorite platform, which would be Spotify, Google, Apple, or the long list of others that you would have. So we're glad you're here, and we hope you enjoy it. Um, this is going to be part one of a four-part series that we've called the Professional Restore. Okay. I talk about professionalism a lot and, and I, I'll make a reference to things and I, I thought we would package up what I, my humble opinion, the traits, the characteristics, the skill sets and the presence of someone in our industry who kind of checks off most all the boxes as a professional. Professional does not mean you know everything, but it means that you have a company of value that people look at. It's what they want to model themselves after. And I think that restore, that company and that individual are less than 10% of our industry. It just is what it is. A lot of people, maybe it's 45% trying to get there, which I applaud. I really, really do. But I think where people are now, less than 10% of people that you would probably recommend for your grandmother's house. But for the other 40%, I'm hoping that after today, you can slide down into the to the circle and be there. Because I think professionalism is absolutely everything for your business. I think it's it's really what creates a, a repetitive business, a reputation, a brand. I think it's a company that people want to do business with. I think it's a company that employees want to work for and they want to grow with. Um, the lack of any of these things you're probably always spending money on marketing. You're probably always trying to convince people how good you are. Um, a really, really good, strong professional company does not have to do either of those things. They just get the business. So I'm going to be looking at some notes today. Um, if I were to ask a hundred people what makes someone a professional, I'd get 99 and a half answers, and I understand that. Um, so to take care of that, whether you're watching this on YouTube, Restoration Advisors YouTube channel, or whether you're listening to it on the podcast, some way, go to our website. But if you have more things that I left off that you want to have a discussion around, let's do it. Because if you're like me, there's just no shortage of things that are going to make somebody a professional. So just leave a comment or check us out in one of our uh, Restoration Nation group on Facebook or our private group. And we'll definitely pick up the conversation carry it and maybe it'll make the next segment that we ever ever film but these were already designed and, and let's go i've got a, a a quote here on uh the screen for you those that are, are listening can't see it it's from red adair red adair was a very famous businessman that did um uh, fault uh fires uh while uh, oil oil fires really really a pioneer in his field uh, if you think it's expensive to hire a professional to do the job Wait until you hire an amateur. Uh, love that. Love that. Uh, really talk a lot about being a professional means a lot of education. Education never ends. And whether you pay for it through a coach, a teacher, a course, or a school, or whether you pay for it with hard knocks, mistakes, and costly money and time, one way or another, you're paying for your education. But you just get to choose which one you want to do. So, um. I think we all presume to be on the same path, uh, hopefully. A real professional says, I'm always a student as well as a teacher. Um, a good teacher always knows that 
every single day you're stacking your new education and it's never really over. I think when you already, when someone stops and says, okay, I think I know everything, I think that's when you're in trouble. So we want to make sure that if you're not there, that you're in the right place, that, uh, that, you're, that you're still on the path to get there. But don't give yourself a hard time if you don't fill all these arenas of this series. Um, the goal is to give you some ideas, your notepad, your pen and paper, and get you there. Um, I wanted to break it down into four pillars that best encompass the high-level measurable. So the first one today is going to be about the technically capable, the technically qualified, if you will, uh, person. I think in our business, it's, it's highly technical, um, and I want to talk a little bit about that. One thing that's important to understand is the professional company still has the same problems you do. Maybe not all of them, but they still have adversity. They still have challenges. Uh, arguably, sometimes they're bigger because the bar is higher. And what some people may just say, ah, it's not that big of a deal. A good professional firm has to respond to them. They have to improve that. So um, there's always work going on to improve for a professional. So to do restoration or mediation work, you need to be very well and clear and aware that the work we do is super important to the health and safety of our staff, the client, and their property. We, the work we do, if done well, can save the homeowner a lot of money, a lot of time, and a lot of value in their property and their things, uh, as well as, as, as their, you know, like I said, their health. We do it wrong. We can really, really change someone's life for the for the worse. We can affect them financially, uh, where they have, uh, you know, we can cause more damage that's not covered by their insurance if they're using insurance as a payment plan or as a uh, a payment method to reimburse them. Um, if we don't do things right, we can we can we can break their house. We can cause more damage. We can, and lots of things can go wrong. So. There's a very, very, very strong need to be considered a professional in those terms. Um, to me, being a professional, and this is a big one for me, means you don't take on jobs and projects and tasks that you're not technically qualified for. Does that make sense? It's okay to push yourself and go beyond but there is a point where if you are not qualified to do that kind of job, you should not. And I'll give you an example in all of the forums and the Facebook groups. Uh, and I can make a lot of examples here, but someone will come aboard and say, Hey, I just signed up my first fire. Can someone tell me how to do a fire? I've never done one. Probably number one for a potential of legal matters. You probably should not put into an open group, even if it's private, attorneys, courts, whatever, find, they can find everything. You just admitted that you don't know how you do this and that anything you do afterwards is going to be under a microscope. It also just says that, you know, you just aren't clear on the path that you're going. Um, so you've got to be a professional to take on the kind of work. Now, if you want to start doing different kinds of work, I'll go back to the education piece. But um, the, and alternatively, a professional company Make sure that things they're qualified for, they market so that their community and the and the, the the neighborhood and the town they're in knows that they have a solution for a very serious problem. Again, if we do fires, maybe you're not doing fires now because water is more profitable. That's a choice. But are we leaving the fires in the hands of people that are underqualified? I don't know. Chasers? Can't stand it. Can't stand fire chasers. Not a professional. Um, do the work that you're technically qualified for and do it well. If you're kind of burnt out of fires, you got stung with a couple of them, fine. Just figure out why and improve it. You know, uh, fix a problem, create a new process, improve a system, whatever that is. But to do the work that you're you're qualified for because your community needs it, okay? Um, lack of expertise in a certain area, people will notice and you will get a new label, and it won't be professional. 
your employees will notice that we're trying to do things that we're not qualified for. I would say doing trauma crime scene cleanup is along those things. Some people try to do that without the training. Um, believe me, the people that you hire you to do that, it's really quick and easy to identify who's, who's good at it and who's not. It, it shows up real quickly and a quick internet search can really, really find out that you're probably taking on work that you shouldn't have. And that won't do good for your brand. You are building something long-term here. Make sure you're doing that. My goal today is to outline uh, uh, on a high level some categories, and I have some lists here. So we're going to talk about these things that are fundamental in components that are going to create the, the, the model of what a professional looks like. First, let's talk about certifications. Uh, a good technically qualified firm will – will have a, a, a huge importance that they put on certifications that pertain to the work that they do. Um, certifications are not education. Let's get that out, out front. I, I say that all the time to people. Getting a certification is, is a path. It's a first step in education, but education is eternal, like I already mentioned. Um, it's it's to get going, but it's the fundamentals. It tells uh, your client, your team, yourself, that I have passed an equivalency test or a comprehensive set of the fundamentals, but I need to seek more. I need to learn more, become an expert at this. I'm just now a novice. I'm a white belt. I want to get to a black belt, and I have to get there. But you don't do that from your first karate lesson. Um, when you talk about the certifications you need, um, there's an argument in the industry. None of them are required, and that's not great. Certifications from the CRC and RIA are are suggested, and I think some people would say they should be required, and maybe they're right. Um, but you need your WRT ASD if you're drying, if you're doing commercial, you, you know, you commercial CDS, FST for fire and safety, fire fire and uh, fire technician, odor, on and on and on, and, and these are just stacked. There's pathways for your certifications to get your master. That's great. A professional firm should have one or several masters on staff. We know that takes a long time. It just goes back to how long this takes. The next one up, look at the ones that you need for right now, and then always have your eye on new services you want to take on. I mentioned crime scene cleanup. I mentioned uh, fire. If you don't do fire now, put it on the agenda, on the calendar, that that's a new cert that I'm going to be going after. So certifications are the ones you currently have and in the path and your your future ones. A good, good, good company is always pursuing future growth and future improvement. Um, underneath certifications, which they aren't necessarily certifications, are laws. And the ones that I rec think everyone should have, I think you should dive into the OSHA catalog, and you should have at least OSHA 10, probably OSHA 40, has Whopper, and then they have a lot of bloodborne pathogen confined space, those individual components and segments that apply to what we do. I think OSHA certifications do not get nearly enough credit and visibility in our industry, and I think you should pursue those. I think a professional company has a team that is really, really clear on OSHA because a lot of things from safety have to do with what we're doing with drying, keeping us safe from indoor air quality. But we're exposed to a lot of hazards from heights, trip hazards, missing floors, tools, et cetera, heat stress. All these things exist. They're not taught in the restoration disaster library of certifications, not the way they should be. So have you going down to, uh, to safety. And then the last one is laws. Uh, underneath, I just put it under certifications, but – a professional company should know the laws. I'm talking about asbestos. I'm talking about um, who can work, what, you know, age of people that can do things, having, you know, having legal rights to do certain things. I, this is not something that's just like, eh, I'll wait till I get in trouble to pay attention to it. Don't do that. That's not professional. Believe me. Someone's going to find out, and the sooner you are ahead of it and learn what those laws are, don't know where to start, get with your local municipality and say, listen, I've got a disaster company, and I want to be on the 
up and up and up. Where can I start to gather information to get as legal as I can to know what my laws are? And, and again, I would go with asbestos because I'm so, so, so ingrained in education of all properties per OSHA should be tested before you do demolition of any required demolition removal or disturbing any materials should be tested for asbestos and lead. Age doesn't matter. Anything. I've got lots and lots of videos and, and content that I've posted about that, but that makes a professional firm. That shrinks that number down. You see where I'm getting at? It's less than 10%. Most people say, ah, I do it if it's 91 or whatever. Doesn't matter. It's bogus. It's a myth. It's as, it's as big of a lie as the O&P argument, okay? The next area of a technically qualified company is uh, their advanced processes. And what do I mean by advanced processes? You know, you've got just what everybody else does. That's one thing. That's not advanced. That's ordinary. That's average. You've got your processes that everybody does this. I think that a professional company, I think that a, a qualified leader of the pack, um, they add an extra layer of preparedness and, and uh, resiliency to what they do. And, and one of these would be ramping, what I call ramping up for a surge or for cat work. If you live in an area where you get uh, weather that causes an abundance of work in a short period of time, whether it be uh, flooding, of course, wildfires, earthquakes, tornadoes often, um, you know, from board ups, let's say, uh, uh, you know, just uh, locust. I don't know anything. But if you have a reason that your business would be in a position to facilitate work during those times, then you have an obligation to make sure you're ready for that. Most people aren't quite ready. They just do what they can. But I think a lot of preparation could be that. And some of those preparations are I put down for new positions. Um, you might have a person or a new position in your company that even if it's only for that time, they go into that mode when it's time. It may be a logistics position. It might be health and safety. Get some people in your company qualified and trained up for a new position when it comes time to do this. This might actually be a, a traveling team that goes down to a storm in Florida or Louisiana or the East Coast from a hurricane. This could be someone that gets deployed away and you need someone there. Maybe it's more of an admin position. Uh, some of your staff might need to be, you know, there's a lot of moving parts when you do a lot of work at one time and keeping up with the paperwork becomes, uh, and, and as well as your regular work, can become very, very, very hindering to the production and getting paid. So you might have some positions like that. So think about that. Think of what you would do that you don't normally do now to have those times. Um, scheduling. You need to work out a process during these ramp-up surges and during cat work. Of, of, of how do we schedule jobs? If you've never dealt with it, it's not unheard of that when there's some flooding going on for you to get 150 calls in an hour and you're making a list, your, your team's making a list, whoever's answering the phone. You might actually turn the phones off. What's important is who's my customer? Are they just calling for information? Can they pay us? I want to help everybody too, but we're not Red Cross. Can they pay you? Insurance isn't always going to cover flood work, so you've got to know how to qualify someone. And then how do you schedule in a way that you don't just burn your team, just kill them? You can't do 100 jobs in a day. Now, how do you schedule up for that? You've got, you know, what do you do if you get more equipment, right? You get more staffing, back to your positions. Sometimes your techs will become supervisors. They'll actually start overseeing other people so that you can broaden your, your capacity. Um, and then the other part of the advanced process and ramping up and surging is documentation. I mentioned a while ago, you've got to have a, a plan, uh, it, whether you use a software or your current process where you do onesies and twosies and your team is kind of paced where they can just, you know, get it done. Well, when you're working and you've got like maybe eight jobs each that you're managing, You've got to have a better system for documenting all those at one time because your documentation means getting paid. How does your team, maybe you go back to pen and paper. Maybe just, maybe because especially during a surge, 
you might be without power. You might have long periods of time where you're out in the rural area and you can't get back to the office and get the internet. You need to have a plan to make sure documentation does not become a last effort and a secondary thing. It stays front and center along with serving the customer. Another thing, advanced processes was um, kind of back to certifications, life health safety measures. I think you've got to have some processes around being a company that has a team in the production roles that have a better understanding about life health safety. And I'm talking about things, heat stress. We deal with uh, uh, mold remediation and sewage losses. We're often wearing Tyvek suits and, and masks. You need to have your team trained on how to work in those conditions as well as recognize other people in signs of heat stress and heat exhaustion. They're very, very critical, and they're very common. It doesn't take long to creep up, especially if someone's not physically used to doing that. So having some training around that and some processes. A general first aid, having a good plan around first aid, whether they be all trucks have first aid kits, yeah, you know, obviously the shop, and I'm talking about not some that have you open them up and there's nothing in them. A real system and process to check those monthly um, and to figure out do we have everything in, in them that serves the kind of work we're doing. Now, it doesn't help if you have the cheapest first aid kit and you're doing some complex jobs and there's nothing in there that apply. You don't. There's no burn cream and you're working around a situation where someone could get burned or cut really bad. A Band-Aid will not hurt, will not help if someone's finger has been sliced horribly. Obviously, you can call 911, but there's some preliminary, preliminary triage that needs to happen there. So having a good general first aid plan on who does that and how do we check it and make sure we always have what we need. Emergency plan for evacuations, uh, who, who to call if something bad happens, whether it be a spill, whether it be um, a fire, you know, just those kinds of things. People tend to, like, freak out when bad things happen. That's why we train. That's why we practice. That's why we build a system and process. If this happens, if someone gets hurt, call 911. I know in our company, um, if someone really, really got hurt bad or had an unknown issue, like maybe it looked like something was heart or a diabetic issue, um, as much as we wanted to throw them in the car and transport them, we had a rule of call 911. They're, you don't want someone riding in your vehicle, not getting the care that they need in the time they need it to, to get worse. You don't know what's going, you don't know their background. EMTs, first responders know how to quickly identify what someone needs. Now, you got to triage this. If it means you can get to the hospital quicker than somebody would get there, you probably got to do it anyway. Have a process around that. Ask the questions. Sit with your team. Have a, a meeting about this. And then the last part of life health safety is a JHA. It's required on all jobs to do a job hazard assessment, a job site safety plan, things like that. So adopt those things. All available in OSHA. Go to OSHA.gov. They've got all your information you need there. Those make a professional company. Okay. Okay. Um, Next, as we move along, I know this is a lot of stuff here. You can watch it again. Luckily, it's recorded. Uh, keep this list. These, this list of things, by the way, will be in the description. We'll have them there for you. Uh, a good company, professional, technically advanced company, has clear SOPs. I know everybody in this industry loves to talk about SOPs, and they wish they had more. Everyone wishes they did. Um, it starts just with the first one, but you've got to have clear SOPs. You got, when I say clear, I, I don't make them so complicated that no one can follow it. <laughs> Cause you're the same as everyone else. You start reading something. Oh, just, but what needs, what's, what's the outcome? What needs to be the result? And, and what do I need to do there? Don't make them like a P SOP for a hundred things at once. Break them down. I know it's more SOPs, but they'll be followed. Um, follow the 80, 20 rule meaning, you know, 20% of your SOPs make up for 80% of the work that you do, right? So focus on those things. Don't make one on how to do something really minor. Do the stuff on how do we answer the phone? How do we respond? How do we check the truck and the vehicles and the equipment? And how do we demo and cut and clean and blah, blah, blah? 
make those bigger ones that uh, you already know how to do. Build containment. Make an SOP on how we build containment. These are now training modules for anyone that comes aboard. Um, once you make these, the question always is, how do I document those? They need to be documented. They, it, it, and, and, and documentation is in multiple ways. You can videotape a presentation. You can have a written form. If it's a, a software, you can take their training from their website and import it into yours. We love the program Trainual here at Restoration Advisors. We're certified coaches for Trainual. It's an online searchable uh, uh, training tool where people are issued uh, training SOPs. They have to take these. You give them a certain amount of time. You can see that someone did finish it. You can actually put a quiz in there. It's a great platform. Down in the link below, we'll have a, a you can check out Trainual with a, uh, I think it's a 14 day trial. Uh, follow the link and, um, It'll tell them Restoration Advisor sent you. Um, if you need some help implementing some of that and have a phone call, let's do it. Uh, clear SOPs, doesn't matter how many you make or how clear they are, how well documented, they have to be followed by all. This is a management leadership thing. You have to make sure that everyone is is following them. That means there's going to be some QC. You can't just assume that I made an SOP and everybody's doing it. Follow up, check on jobs, have that figured out. Have them updated. You change your SOPs and processes often. It could be because of a new tool, a new software. You went to a class, learned a new way to do things. Make sure the updates are getting to the people that need to know. Back to Trainual. If someone took a previous SOP training and you update it and give them a new one, they're alerted via email or text that they have a new thing to learn. They have to go there and learn it. And then now they have absorbed the new way and you have accountability so you can hold them accountable for that. Um, and then again, the last thing I said, clear, but also simple. Clear and simple, same thing. Don't make it overly complex. If it's got to be really, really, really difficult, it might be a position that one person holds to do that. Uh, it might be more of a workshop that you hold in the office. And uh, some things you're going to need, though. Some things you're going to... Uh, we're going to talk about training next, but we're going to talk about uh, uh, sometimes things need to be broken down into more of a, a, a training class, uh, 20 minutes, 30 minutes or something like that. But you still need to document as simple as you can, small bite-sized pieces to get to the goal. Don't get caught up with trying to uh, um, um, design how they get the goal. Some Some people will do things a little bit differently to get the same results. Let that be, as long as it doesn't apply, you know, doesn't mess up your system. Results are what matters, how they got there, not always as much. Professional company has that figured out. You see a great, big, nice company. It Everyone that works there is not just trying to figure out. They're not reinventing the wheel every single day. It would not be big, and it would not be a successful company. It wouldn't be profitable, and they would not have scaled to the level of having that many people if they are that way. Now, Management can stop paying attention to SOPs, and it can get chaotic. But at some point, they had to have some processes to get there. Believe me. Um, the next thing for a company to be professional is uh, a training and a development culture. I call it a path. Um, you need to have a, a, a culture of training. You're a restoration company that's always training its people. You, you want good people that can do stuff without you doing it right. It's your lack of training is why they're coming to you and asking you or they're not doing it right. You have to do everything because you haven't trained anyone. Maybe you're not a great trainer, and I get that. Let's figure out how to make that the case. But to get to be a professional firm, you've got to figure that out. You've got to figure out how to train and elevate yourself and delegate to everybody else. And But they just can't do it on their own. So, uh First one is, where does everyone start uh, training path? When someone comes to your company, you've hired them with experience, without. What's the, first, what's the first 30 days look like? What's the first week look like? Where do they learn first? Do you have the processes that we just talked about? Where does everyone start, and then where are they going? I call it a path because we've got to go that way. We've got to follow this path to get to where we need to go to be a, a, a strong piece of the company. Um, and that goes into my next one, career path. Uh, when, when I get a, 
a job, when I was a younger person trying to create my resume, I like to show up and say, I know where I'm starting. It's important. But where am I going? How long is it going to take me to get there? What, what opportunities do I have? That's the question that most people are saying. I just need an opportunity. You give me a, you give me a chance, I'll ride that rocket, dude. But I need to know what they are, not just, hey, start here. Let's see how you do. I'm probably still taking calls and res- applications at other places. I'm probably still looking for a place because I want to know where it goes. We don't do that too much. I mean, you're going to start as a tech. No, what's it take to get to a lead tech? We have some tools for that, the tech levels. What's it take? What's after a lead tech? Project manager, operations manager, estimator, business development. How can I get there to be driving the nice car and buying the house? Career path. It's very important to people. We don't take that in consideration enough. If you have someone on your team that doesn't care what their career path is, they shouldn't be on your team. It's the wrong person. Um, we talk about the tech levels. Uh, every division of your company, fire, water, mold, recon, trauma, contents, should have a, a level one, two, three, maybe four and five. Depends on the complexity of the, the genre, the, the niche. But they should have what's required for me as a tech level part one. And how do I get to tech level two? Once a, a supervisor has seen me competently perform all those tasks, maybe multiple times without supervision, I can move to the next level. And then those equal new training, maybe pay positions, et cetera. You kind of get where I'm at. We have that all broken down for restoration advisors. It's going to be part of our new academy in 2023. So if those are the levels that you're looking to implement, we're uh, we're going to help you. We're going to help you get to this professional level. If you're not there now, we're going to we you know that's what we do. We guide people, and that's why I'm making this podcast is to help everyone understand where you are now, where you want to go. And then again, mention again, career path, clarity of opportunity. They need to be clear in what they can do. Um, if they don't see where they're going, they're not very excited about going there. You and I, we're going to go on a trip and we get on a bus or a train or a plane. And we don't know where we're going, and we don't know what we're going to do when we get there. We just I get on the plane. I'm going to be a little uneasy. I'm going to be not so comfortable with that. Um, so cur- they need to have clarity on that. You get again. Next subject: training culture. You need to have a culture of of of, of training, growth minded uh, efforts for your team and your people and your company and your opportunities. Um, I would say that's number one. Weekly, monthly meetings. You should define a real schedule about what meetings do I have weekly, technical, soft skills, uh, customer job reviews, what meetings are we having to train? Even talking about the jobs that we did is training. What did we learn? Did it go well? Did it not go well? After action reports, what monthly meetings are we having? Are we bringing in other people in the community to talk to us about safety and and, uh, adjusters Maybe an agent comes into your office talking about their experience with us. That's training. What does that look like for you? Great companies have that mapped out for months and even for the year coming forward. We're going to have this. We're going to have HR come in. We're going to help people deal with their money and financial wellness. Train, train, train. Invest in your team through training. Um, You need to have a plan on uh, tied into that. What training and sessions are on-site and off-site? You've got those in your, your training room, your break room, your kitchen, wherever you do that in your shop. But what about when it takes comes time to who's going away for CRC classes or specialty conferences or something like that? You've got to have that mapped out. Who's qualified to go? Tech level this, blah, 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 positions for this. But, again, let someone know that throughout the year, this is how it's going to go. This is what the roadmap, the GPS looks like. And then evaluations around training. Uh, does no good to train people if you don't follow up to see that they're doing it. You don't wait till you get a complaint or even a good review saying, ah, great, I trained Jackson. I trained Sarah on how to do something, and, you know, she's got it down. But we went a year before we figured out that she was actually doing it. Make evaluations. Staff love to be evaluated. If they're, doing, if they're a good team member, they like, evaluate me. You trained us, I just want you to see them doing well. Because they're trying to advance. They're trying to promote themselves. They're trying to get raises. You need to do that to, to make sure you give them that. A professional company 
has a really, really good idea around evaluations, how they're done, who does them, and what happens when they get them. And also, what do you do with uh, weaknesses? Uh, you know, you say, hey, go back to training. Having a system for training. So, yeah, you know what? We're not, we're not picking that, that part up real well. We're not, the board ups didn't go too well. Great. Now I know. Let's go back and do that. Speaking of evaluations as a subject, um, when? When do we do them? How often? Who performs them? Is it always managers? How about mentors? How about peers? We talk a little bit about that. Um, and then what's the outcome? What happens at different evaluations? Is it a monthly? Is it quarterly? Is it the annual? Is it twice a year? Is it a skip level? I like skip levels. I like when technicians has an evaluation with uh, someone from business development and vice versa. They do that together to evaluate. Honestly, uh, a tech likes to hear that the business development person says, you know, I'm outside to sell the work all the time, but I keep hearing that we're, we're late getting to jobs. Technician says, well, our trucks never run or we're doubles booked. Well, now you've just identified a real issue. You're going to go back to the operations manager and say, listen, we, we kind of talked collectively. We both want the same thing here. But uh, we, we have this thing in the way. Can we, can we address that? It becomes something that we start to train on and address, maybe identify a weakness we didn't know we had until we had this evaluation together. And then the last piece of the training development path is the experience mentorship. You need to develop a, a, a mentorship mindset in your company. You as the owner, the CEO, or whoever is watching and listening to this, can't do everything. The more you can delegate, the more people that are in your team that know how to do what you do allows you to do bigger things, things that matter a lot more than little. But you need to develop some mentors. If you've got someone that's been a lead tech for you for two years, let's talk about making them, a, a, assigning them that thing. You know what? Maybe it's another 50 cents an hour. Maybe it's a, another perk. I don't know. Um, but have them on the path with you on new new employees, new onboarding, and they're going to be assigned. You may have two or three mentors. How many can one person mentor at a time? Maybe two, maybe one. And um, but but build something around that. Uh, have training. You got to train them to be a mentor. You can't just say, "Hey, you're a mentor." What are they measuring? What are they asking? What are they doing? How often? How often do they meet? What what ability do they have to? fix something as they see it, report it. What is it? They got a training of what that looks like. And then um, advancement that maybe you've been a mentor for a certain period of time. Maybe that, that matched with your tech levels. Maybe it's up for a promotion. You can still be a mentor, but maybe you're, maybe you're time to be a project manager. Maybe you just need to be, there's just a few things that are lacking in the project manager job description. And if we look at that job description and the tech says, well, my communication skills aren't great great that we know what to work on mentorship helps you see who's really in it to win it and to, to grow from there and, and and these are all just things that i think professional technically qualified companies have this is this is what your customer expects this is what the public expects that you're working on all the time well let's make sure we are and and put that front and center i know we're in the emergency services i know things come up and i know it's hard to find the time Make the time. If it means don't schedule jobs one morning till 10 a.m., don't schedule jobs till 10 a.m. Tell all your customers, saying we got a very important train to come up. But your customer will understand because you're trying to be the most technically qualified company that does what you do. That's how you become a professional. You're not going to be a pro if you say, if your marketing says we're the best and you're not, now you're a liar. <laughs> you don't be a liar. So, if you already have most of these or it's even some of them in place, you're on your way. Hopefully we talked about something that you said, you know, I could be better there. Then that's a win. Uh, you're going to be higher up in that percentage. Um, I visit and consult with many contractors across the country, and most do not have over 50% of this stuff in place, just to be honest with you. I don't need anyone to lie. You don't need to be embarrassed if you're watching this. Just, let's just, it's just an opportunity to grow, to, to get better, um, but make time with it, for it. You know, it's, it's not going to happen on its own. And the longer you don't do it is the longer and the harder you've got to work with marketing and, and sell yourself. Uh, these things start to help you sell. Um, now that you've got a roadmap to the technical aptitude, um, you can start 
really, really promoting that we might be the, the most qualified uh, professional restoration firm in our region. And here's why. Here's the 40 things that we do that you never see. Outline them. Tell the story. Tell the public what you do. That's it for today. I want you to join us next week as we discuss still in this series part two about leadership and culture. Uh, it ties into the things we've already talked about, but we're going to have some more things about leadership that I think are really going to help you understand uh, the difference between being a boss and being a leader. So enjoyed having you here. Can't wait to see you next week. If you have any comments, let us know. Take care.